My name is Nikolas Bobrinsky. This is my journey with the European Space Agency and the European Space Operations Center. ESA employs some of the world's leading scientists, engineers and experts. They are spread across different programs in Europe and around the world. Over the span of several decades, I have accompanied space safety and deep space communication on its journey from its beginning as a small seed, through the innovation it produced to becoming one of ESA's fastest growing programs. In this video series, I am sharing stories and memories and some lessons I have learned along the way in my 35-year career in space. I hope that you watching will be inspired to become part of the next generation of the European space industry and you will go forward with curiosity, passion and confidence. Managing a program like the Space Safety Program is not always an easy task. Uh, sometimes you have to, to cope with um, situations which are not straightforward and uh, which require um, not immediate reaction, but uh, also um, accepting yeah, that not everybody will um, play its role or, or supporting the program uh, at, at any point in time. And uh, this is something which we have experienced at the beginning of the program, where after the uh, successful preparatory phase. Uh, there were some countries which were facing possibilities to have different approaches to uh, um, to the space safety program or to the to the parts of the space safety program in Europe, and um, taking other other steps. And and of course this was debated and sometimes very harshly debated. But uh, uh, it was necessary to go through this. And accepting also that during a certain point in time, some of the member states, of the ESA member states, could uh, back up from the program. And uh, there was nothing wrong with this. It's, uh, it's a natural thing which can happen. And um, what is important in this, in this stage is to, to really accept that this can happen, uh, continue with the program because you believe that this is the right way to do it and uh, that there is uh, enough resources here yeah, for other member states to continue. And then you see uh, often that after two or three years of interruption, th those who have left the, the boat maybe for two or three years will, will come back because they cannot also uh, see and they don't want to see the program going further with other participants and leaving them on the, on, on the, on the side of the road. So one has to, to accept this, a certain dynamic in the participation of the program, a little bit less, then later a bit more. Um, but this is something which is, uh, which is quite important and uh, gives, uh, uh, introduces a little, a little bit of briefing into the, into the program. So this, uh, this is what uh, was happening also in SSA. And one of the challenges was to, to accept this dynamic and not necessarily demand that uh, everybody would contribute to its uh, possible and maximum capabilities. And you know, uh, when you interact with the ESA member states, uh, whatever happens, you need to uh, leave the door open even if uh, at a certain point in time you are disappointed about the out outcome of some of the meetings, or some of the decisions which they may take. But you need to understand that these decisions may be necessary at this point in time and they may apply during a certain time only. And uh, leaving the doors open keeps the possibility for them to re-enter the program at a later stage. So this is something which uh, needs to be secured and it's a uh, very important way to uh, secure the dynamic of the program and the later wholehearted support uh, of all the member states to the, to the program. To lead a team is something which is uh, quite, uh, quite challenging. And uh, what needs to be done in the first place is really to, uh, to make sure that you have very well defined the objective. Where do you want to take your team to? What is uh, expected from the team? what is expected from the program or your department or your division. And uh, once this is set up, this makes the whole thing quite easy because you will define the tasks for every participant of the team and you will know precisely what needs to be done and achieved. 
We can draw the, the analogy with, uh, with a choir. A choir conductor will have all the parts available, and all the parts being then baritones, bass, soprani, alto, uh, will know uh, what they need to sing. And um, they will be able to sing the part with minimum guidance from the, the choir conductor. And uh, the choir conductor will intervene if somebody uh, sings the wrong part or doesn't perform or does sings too loud or to the contrary, too soft. But uh, uh, the choir conductor will ensure that the choir delivers and that everybody in the choir and also in the audience has, uh, has pleasure and fun in uh, interpreting the piece. One uh, common mistake which uh, maybe some of the managers can, can do, which I really uh, recommend to, to be very careful about, uh, is uh, to avoid micromanaging. This is something which would uh, upset people. Um, it will undermine the capability to create themselves um, uh, their own participation in the tasks, in the common endeavor. Um, once the objective is set, uh, it's not necessary to uh, explain with all details what everybody needs to do. Uh, it's, there is so much room for uh, individual uh, individual participation and definition of, uh, of work which needs to be done by everybody. And uh, uh, this is what makes also fun and uh, leaves a lot of room for creativity of the people. And this is essential. Uh, micromanagement will kill it, but uh, avoiding micromanaging will ensure you a lot of success. Also, when uh, looking back in the, in the program, there is a certain point in time when uh, you see that you can draw the lines and take stock of what, of what has been achieved. And you will see most of the time a lot of successes which have been achieved by the members of the teams. And it's really important that you as managers give uh, the proper reward to, to those who have achieved uh, excellent results, that you also give positive feedback because people also need to be encouraged in what they are doing. They need to understand whether they are on the right track or to the, on the wrong, wrong track as well. This can happen. But in any case, to receive a feedback. And especially if the work is which they are performing is good, it's uh, essential to give them this positive feedback and when possible rewards as well. The, the real communication between people at, at any occasion is absolutely essential in this, uh, for this type of very complex missions because people are so passionate about these uh, missions. They want to talk about this at uh, any any point in time, also including the lunch breaks. And um, one day during a, a lunch break, during which many colleagues were, were involved from NASA and from ESA in particular, um, they were discussing about this last phase of the Cassini-Huygens mission. And uh, a colleague uh, brought the topic that uh, he had some doubts about uh, the capability of the Cassini receiver to receive the Huygens signal also during the descent phase due to a very high Doppler effect. And this idea was just dropped over lunch. As a result, a few hours later, uh, the colleagues who were responsible for this uh, space communication said, oh, there was this idea which was brought during the lunch. We need to make an additional check on this. So they redid the calculations, made all the uh, evaluation of the Doppler effects uh, during this last uh, phase of the Huygens descent and they discovered that there was a flow in the mission concept and that if everything would be left like this, the Doppler shift would be too high for the Cassini receiver and as a result, the data would not be able to be received. The result and the effect of this would be a total loss of this last phase of the Huygens mission. In today's environment where we are confronted with more, more and more off-site work, uh, it is still essential to, to keep in mind that uh, the direct communication remains absolutely essential. Uh, the direct communication triggers a lot of uh, informal communication as well. And uh, people are then able to exchange information which uh, comes to their mind without being necessarily on a very precise agenda. Uh, so uh, it gives the possibility to people to um, take a higher view about uh, what they are after and sometimes to come with uh, novel and bright ideas which uh, in a purely online environment will, uh, will not be possible because uh, the environment is too constrained. It's, uh, it's really essential, especially in these times of, uh, of COVID and post-COVID, that um, now that we are used also to, uh, to online communication, that we make this online communication 
and very trusty, that we trust in each other. And this is certainly possible when we already know uh, the people with whom we are working, or the people in our teams. And uh, this is certainly something which works quite well. It's extremely efficient and uh, you are able to, to work and, uh, and share the, the information without losing time in transport, in setting up the systems and all this. So this works beautifully. However, uh, in my opinion, this is not fully sufficient because it's also important to see the people, to, uh, to have lunch with them, uh, to pass some uh, informal messages, uh, which otherwise during an online con connection would uh, bear the risk to be, to be lost. So a mixture of both online communication and more informal direct face-to-face -face communication is, in my view, something which could be uh, optimized and is the optimum uh, way to, to work in teams.